All right, hello guys, welcome back for another one. Um, today what we're gonna do is uh, the EOC practice questions uh, to review for your upcoming test, which will be over imperialism, World War I, and uh, part of the 1920s. Um, so today the questions we're gonna go over are the imperialism and World War I questions, because they do kind of go hand in hand. Um, I just wanted to remind you of the purpose of these videos because there were some questions last time. Um, the reason why I go over these style of questions is not to teach you anything new. Um, it's kind of a review and it, mainly the reason why we do it is to practice for the style of questions you'll see at the end of the year when we take our end of course test. Um, and I do realize that on the video I was looking at it a minute ago, it looks like uh, some of these you might not be able to see that well. But uh, remember, you can visit my website and download these, um, or you can just email me and say, hey, how do I get these questions? I can send them to you. Um, so let me take a look one more time and just make sure everything's looking good and we're recording everything looks good. Cool. Okay, um, it's gonna be quite a few questions, so this video might be on a little bit of a longer side, so uh, take breaks as needed, pause as needed, and email me as needed. Um, and remember, probably not going to learn anything new from these videos, but it will be good practice uh, for the style of question that you're going to see, okay? Um, and remember, some of these uh, questions do pop up on our tests in this class. So it's a good idea to watch these and uh, practice these on your own, okay? All right, so here we go. Number one, this goes, this goes with standard US-19. So we're in the imperialism, age of imperialism. Um, remember, I always like to kind of look at the question first and then look at our, uh, our source here and just kind of see if I can figure it out that way, okay? So it says, which sentence completes the diagram by analyzing how this interest in international affairs affected United States foreign policy? Woo, fancy question, okay? So let's take a look at the diagram. It says, European powers established spheres of influence in China, giving them control of Chinese trade. So we're talking about other countries trading in China. The United States advocated the open door policy, allowing the United States to trade with China. Now, we didn't necessarily talk about uh, the open door policy. We didn't mention that specifically when we went over the age of imperialism. But one thing we did talk about was that the United States and Europe, the United States was wanting to show Europe that, the, that we were very powerful, okay? And um, the way we did this was to use this Roosevelt corollary which said we are dominant within our hemisphere, we are dominant in this part of the world, and you need to stay out of this part of the world because it's our area of the world. So for this one, I would go with C, okay? There are a couple good answers on this one, but I think the best answer on this one is C. It says the United States sought to secure dominance in the hemisphere. And the reason why I chose that one, I didn't choose B, because it says the United States utilized military force to protect business investments. They didn't really get involved in any kind of military stuff in China with Europe. Um, we didn't fight any European powers in China. Um, if you look at A, it says the United States applied political pressure to impose democratic traditions. You could argue that, but the best answer is definitely going to be C. And then D, that's going to come later with um, uh, World War I and Wilson's 14 points. Okay, So number one is C. Alright? Cool. Right. So let's take a look. Or US 21, it says, many factors contributed to the United States annexation of Hawaii in 1898. Annexation means taking over somewhere else, okay? Uh, let's take a look at the question before we read this. It says, how did Christian missionaries influence Hawaii's culture? Well, let's take a look at this. It says, in the 1800s, Christian missionaries came to Hawaii. Many Hawaiian rulers converted to Christianity. As a result, some traditional native practices were banned, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it says, uh, Native Hawaiians who wanted to retain their cultural identity largely influenced the anti-annexation. Hawaiians who converted to, to Christianity support the idea of becoming a territory of the United States. Okay, so how did Christian missionaries influence Hawaii's culture? Look what it says. As a result, some traditional Native practices were banned. That means gotten rid of, including these things, okay? So um, if we're looking at how did these missionaries influence their culture, it's definitely going to be A. They altered traditional beliefs and behaviors of the native people because they banned certain practices. Okay? All right. I know this is kind of boring. Um, as I was reading that, I was like, wow, this is the most interesting thing ever. Um, but guys, I promise you, some good practice always does, it, it will help you out. Okay? All right, number three. 
During the Spanish-American War, the Anti-Imperialist League was founded to oppose imperial expansion. So we're looking at anti-imperialists. This excerpt is from its platform. Let's uh, pause right there, though. Number three, how would a supporter of imperialism respond to this argument? So you're looking at an anti-imperialist argument, and you're wanting to figure out the opposite side, because it says, uh, how would a supporter, and remember, this is anti-imperialist, okay? Um, so we're just going to have to read it, because it doesn't just give it away. It says, we earnestly condemn the policy of the present, present national administration in the Philippines. It, stink, it seeks to extinguish the spirit of 1776 in those islands. We deplore the sacrifices of our soldiers and sailors whose bravery deserves admi admiration even in an unjust war. We protest against the extension of American sovereignty by Spanish methods. All right, so how would a supporter of imperialism, so this is anti-imperialism, what's the other way, okay? So imperialists, what do they want? They're big supporters. They believe the United States is doing the right thing. So they think that when they're taking over other places, that's doing the right thing for the United States. So for this one, a supporter of imperialism might say that annexing the Philippines will advance the interests of the United States. Because they don't really care about all this. This is what they want. They want the United States to be stronger and to be more powerful, okay? All right. Next question, number four, it says this flow chart identifies some characteristics of the United States in the late 1800s. So we got industrialization, surplus of goods, search for new overseas markets, coaling stations needed for refueling. So which phrase completes the chart by analyzing how these characteristics affected the foreign policy of the United States? All right, so talking about when America got really good at producing stuff. So this is the Gilded Age. So we got a lot of stuff. Okay, and we want to go somewhere else and sell it. And as we're journey journeying around the globe looking for new overseas markets, we need places to stop and refuel. And we talked specifically about the, uh, the Hawaiian Islands as being a refueling station on the way to the Philippines and China, okay? And what did we do to the Hawaiian Islands? Well, we took them over. And a kind of a nicer way of saying that, instead of saying take it over, we acquired those territories. So you're going to go with D, acquisition of territories, okay? So four is D. Cool. Very good. Moving right along. US 19. All right, so here we've got a type of journalism. And it says, destruction of the warship Maine was the work of an enemy. And it's a type of journalism. Um, we also know that the warship Maine, we don't actually know how exactly it exploded, and we call this yellow journalism, okay? And remember, yellow journalism is to get people excited, to get people psyched up to go do something. So it says, how did this type of article contribute to American imperialism? Well, we know that when the USS Maine blew up, America was interested in going to war with Spain, okay? The American people read this stuff and they're like, whoa, crazy, we're not happy, we want to go fight Spain, all right? So which one of these is a fancy way to go fight Spain around the globe? So how did this type of article contribute to imperialism? Pressuring the government to cease Asian trade? and eh, not really. B, by convincing the public to support overseas intervention? That's a pretty good guess. Let's leave a mark on that one so we know. By decreasing a military buildup to protect the mainland, no way. Okay, we know that this decreasing, that makes it wrong, so that's not it. By encouraging alliances with European nations, eh, not yet. That's going to come later. So B is definitely going to be our best answer. B is our best answer here, okay? So five is B. We want to go now. We want to go fight Spain because of this, all right? Very good. Five is B. Sorry, I should have circled that a little better. Five is B, okay? Cool. Number six is from US 20, so the imperialism standard still. Uh, this speech is from a speech by Senator Orville Platt in 1899. Let's we'll skip it for right now. Which statement explains why Senator Platt's justification of the Philippine occupation helped the imperialists prevail? Do you see how these questions are getting harder and harder as far as the wording in it? And, but hopefully you're getting more used to seeing these because we're doing them more and more, okay? So Senator Platt, so which statement explains why Senator Platt's justification of the Philippine occupation helped the imperialists prevail? In other words, 
it, what is his reasoning why imperialism is winning? So Platt is a, uh, he's an imperialist, especially based on this, um, and I'm gonna have to read it to you because it doesn't just tell us anything here, okay? So it says, when the stars and stripes float over the courthouses and schoolhouses of the Philippine Islands, they will not signify despotism, aka tyranny, but justice, security, and the rights of man. Our flag floating there will symbolize liberty, regulated and governed by law, and the largest measure of self-government consistent with the welfare of its people. All right, he said some really important stuff there, and he said some really beautiful sounding things, okay? He says, our flag floating there will symbolize liberty, regulated by law, and the largest measure of self-government. So what he's saying is that uh, when we take over the Philippines, we're going to be spreading our democracy, okay? Because liberty and self-government, those are the basic tenets of democracy. So if we look down here and we're looking for something that has to do with democracy, if we take a look at C, 6 is going to be C, imperialists claim United States rule would result in an expansion of democracy. Remember the idea that America is the exception. We are the democracy. We're the amazing country that needs to go spread around the globe and uh, spread out our wonderful ideas and uh, the democracy stuff, okay? Very good. Keep on a moving. All right, now we're ready for US 21. And question number one. So it says, how do these events affect the United States? So it says, USS Maine sinks in Havana Harbor. US Congress declares war. Treaty of Paris is signed. That ends the, uh, the Spanish-American War. So let's see. Uh, F, they increase public support for cuts in US defense spending. Eh, not really. G, they prompted the end of dollar diplomacy in Latin America. Uh, we haven't even got to dollar diplomacy yet. H, they set a precedent of including territorial acquisitions and settlements. Kind of. Let's look at J. They helped establish the United States as an imperial power similar to, to European nations. Now, this is talking about the Spanish-American War. The United States has beaten England in two wars, the American Revolution and the War of 1812. Now we get to the Spanish-American War, we've defeated Spain. So this makes us a world power. We've defeated two big world powers, the English and the Spanish. And if you recall from other history classes you've learned before, the English and the Spanish are the great European imperial powers. We've now defeated them both. So what does that make us? That makes us a great imperial power. So number one is going to be J. Okay? So there you go. Moving right along. Number two for US 21 on this page. What was one economic effect of the Spanish-American War? I like questions like this because it's just a straight up question. What's one economic effect of the Spanish-American War? Now, because of this, we get new territories. We get the Philippines, Cuba, and Puerto Rico, okay? And uh, because of that, we call those things new markets. And in those places, we can extract resources. We can take stuff from those places and take it and make lots of money off of it. So um, your best answer for this one is gonna be C. The United States gained direct access to additional natural resources and overseas markets. Sweet. Pretty easy. All right. So number three for US 21. So let's look at the question before we read all this. Which statement would most likely be found in a history of the economic impact of the Spanish-American War on the United States? So if you were to read a book called A History of the Economic Impact of the Spanish-American War on the United States, which would be the most interesting book ever. Ah. All right, but anyway, which of these statements would you find in a book called The History of the Economic Impact of the Spanish-American War? So we're looking for what happened with the economy in the United States after the Spanish-American War, so let's see. Statement one, the U.S. oil industry boomed due to oil deposits found in conquered territories. And we haven't really got to oil yet. Hang on on that one. Uh, number two, rebuilding its devastated army cost the United States an enormous amount of money. That one's totally wrong because number one, we didn't even have a big army at the time. And number two, it wasn't devastated because we won. Okay, so forget that one. Okay. Statement three, the acquisition of new territories allowed for the expansion of U.S. commercial trade. Eh, that one seems pretty good. Let's hang on to that one. Let's put a little check by it so we can see. Statement four, territorial losses forced the United States to purchase expensive natural resources from other countries. We didn't lose any territory in the Spanish-American War. We gained territory. We gained Cuba, Hawaii, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico, okay? So remember, we gained new territory, 
and that allows us to go more places, it allows us to take stuff from those places, and it allows us to go there and make lots and lots of money. So your best option is gonna be statement three, H, statement three. Cool. Moving right along, I think we're almost done with this. All right, so check it out. This is super easy, I love this question because it's easy. I love the easy questions. These questions kind of irritate me how hard they make them, but it is what it is. Remember, if we play the game, we play to win. Um, so if we look at the graph, look, the white bar and the black bar. The white bar is Panama Canal. The black bar is the Magellan Straits, which is that area where you go around the tip of South America, so you go really, really far. You can see you're gonna go a whole lot faster if you cut through the Panama Canal based on mileage. It's a lot shorter distance, so therefore faster travel, okay? So what's the main effect of the changes shown in this graph on the Western United States? So, um, so for West United States, let's see. If they're able to cut through South America, rather than having to go all the way around the tip of South America, they've got a much shorter journey to get from the west side to the east side. They can cut through very easily, okay? So what's the main effect? It's gonna be um, that Western US businesses traded more efficiently with the East Coast and Europe, okay? So they kind of threw a, threw a wrench in there, and if you notice, it kind of tripped me up a little bit, because I was like, well, it's gonna be trade posts, through blah, blah, blah. But I was like, wait, what about Western United States? We didn't even really talk about this. But if you take a look, it makes it very easy. Western US businesses traded more efficiently. They're going faster, it's a shorter journey, everything's a whole lot better, okay? Cool. Let's keep rocking and rolling. All right, so, which number territory, number five, which number territory did the U.S. gain by winning the Spanish-American War? Remember I told you we got the Philippines, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Hawaii. Notice none of those things are on there except for number one, Puerto Rico. So your answer is A. Five is A. Ooh, that red's nice. There you go. So five is A. Almost done, y'all, on this page. It's going to get a lot more interesting once we get past this imperialism stuff, and I do apologize. All right, so we've got a big, long source. Remember the question, what were these Hawaiian citizens protesting? So um, we know that the U.S. took over Hawaii, but um, let's read it right here. We, the undersigned Native Hawaiian citizens who are members of the Hawaiian Patriotic League of the Hawaiian Islands and others who are in sympathy with the said league, earnestly protest against the addition of said Hawaiian Islands to the said United States of America in any form or shape. So it doesn't really give you much, but we know that the U.S. took over Hawaii, and people who are Hawaiian citizens may not have liked it. So uh, you're going to be looking at F on this one. So they are protesting. It says, what are they protesting? They are protesting the forced annexation. Forced annexation means we took them over as a U.S. territory after the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy. Remember, we went in and we kicked Queen Lily off the throne, and we said, no more, Queen Lily. This is ours now, whether you like it or not. Um, and the Hawaiians, not everybody was psyched about it. In fact, a lot of people were not psyched about it. So there you go. Okay, so we're moving right along. Right. All right, US 20, this is number, I didn't put a number on it, oh well. What was the focus of this speech? It says, they ask us how we will govern these new possessions. I answer, out of local conditions and, in the, and the necessities of the case, methods of government will grow. If England can govern foreign lands, so can America. If Germany can govern foreign lands, so can America. If they can supervise protectorates, so can America. So this dude's definitely an imperialist. He loves taking over other places, as you can tell. If England can do it, so can we. If Germany can do it, so can we. So what is the focus of this speech? Well, if it's pro-imperialism, imperialists want to take over other places. A fancy way of saying that is the annexation of overseas territory. So there you have that one. Very good. We're doing good, y'all. All right. So check this out. Uh, we got to read the question. Mahan's books influenced U.S. efforts to become a world power primarily by. Now I'll just go ahead and tell you up front. Mahan is a strong imperialist. He wants to take over other places. But because it doesn't straight up tell us anything right here, let's go ahead and take a look. It says in 1890, Captain Thayer Mahan, a lecturer in naval history and the president of the United States Naval War College, published The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, a revolutionary analysis of the importance of naval power as a factor in the rise of the British Empire. Two years later, he, he comp 
completed a supplementary volume, The Influence of Sea Power Upon the French Revolution and Empire. Okay, so this dude is down with the Navy. He loves the Navy, and he also likes taking over other places. So, let's take a look. Mahan's books influenced U.S. efforts to become a world power primarily by, well, advocating overseas expansion. That's a straight up basic answer, but it does do the job. Let's see what else is down there. Emphasizing the need for tariffs. Doesn't talk anything about tariffs. Demonstrating the risks of trade. Doesn't talk about any risks. Arguing against forming overseas alliances. And eh, not really. So your best answer could be F for Alfred Thayer Mahan. Okay. All right. All right, check it out. It's Teddy Roosevelt, and he's got his big stick policy there. Remember, speak softly and carry a big stick. But look, there's something special going on. Roosevelt is sitting in a boat in the water. Uh -oh. So, something to do with Roosevelt and the water that happened during his presidency that he was a big fan of is the Panama Canal Zone. So, number two, this one, the you, this cartoon, comments on tactics used to obtain control of the Panama Canal Zone. It's going to be J. And I don't know why I didn't number that one. All right, so that one's J. Very good. And guys, I know this is really boring. I do apologize. I don't even really have fun doing this, but um, it's something we got to do. Um, and I think it, it's a good way to get you a lot of exposure to the type of question you're going to see. And you see a lot of them are really, really easy. Like if you see Roosevelt in the water in a boat, you know, it's probably referencing this Panama Canal Zone, okay? So let's go ahead and go on to 23 and 24. Um, these are gonna be a whole lot easier, hopefully, and a little bit more interesting. I'm not a huge fan, like I said, of doing these questions, but like I said, it's something we gotta do, and with the better we get at it, the better we'll be, all right? So what's the title of this list? What's the best title of this list? So we need to look at the list. The Rise of Militarism, Upset the Balance of Power in Europe. Political interference caused tensions throughout Europe. Uh oh. Germany, Austria Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire aligned, aka alliances, uh oh, Ooh, look at that handwriting, uh, against France, Russia, and Great Britain. So we've got militarism, we've got nationalism and imperialism here, and then we've got alliances. Well, it sounds like I've heard several of the causes of World War I. So number one is going to be F. Which is the following is the best title for that list. That is Outbreak of World War One. That's what they're headed towards. All right. Cool, cool, cool. See, this is not too bad. It's getting better. Those imperialism questions, it's been a while. All right. So remember, always read the question first. Why was England unable to achieve this goal? I don't know what goal they're talking about, so I gotta look up here. It says the government has officially notified Serbia that war is declared, so Austria has declared war on Serbia. It is understood that England is seeking a basis on which Germany, France, and England by action at Vienna might prevent a spread of the conflict. So England is wanting to make some alliances to not get in a war, okay? Uh, so what we, can we see here, all right? Why was England unable to achieve this goal? Well, look, Germany's here. They help out Austria. We got some alliances going on with France and England. And so all of these alliances, what happened in World War I, they all end up declaring war on each other. And so it's going to be D, two is D. A system of military alliances required other nations to respond. So remember, England may have wanted to stay out of it, but they couldn't because their friends jumped in. Bum, 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 bummer. Watch out for those entangling foreign alliances. All right, check it out. A big, long source. Yay! I know, I'm sorry. I'm being sarcastic today. I need to quit. Gotta get my mood right. <laughs> All right, number three. What was one result of the events reported in the excerpt above? So we gotta look and figure out a result of what all this stuff is. It says, militant Americanism was dominant in Washington today in those quarters of the Capitol where action counts in this perilous time. By one bold strike, President Wilson had emboldened the timid, scattered his enemies, and brought honest critics to his side. The exposure of the German government's attempt to line up in Japan, line up Japan and Mexico and with Germany in a war against the United States, I'm talking about the Zimmerman telegram here, uh, caused hesitating senators and representatives to come out in the open with declarations of support of the president and his method of dealing with the German submarine miss. While the international situation is becoming more critical, the atmosphere has been cleared of doubt and Germany's enmity is now clearly revealed. That means Germany's status as an enemy. Okay, so, 
Zimmerman telegram. Germany's got the submarines going wild. So what's going to do? What are we, what's gonna happen next, okay? So remember, this is early 1917. Before 1917, the US was neutral. But two things got us out from being neutral. First of all, Germany's submarines kept blowing up US ships and our friends' ships. Second of all, Germany wrote a letter to Mexico called the Zimmerman Telegram and it said, hey, why don't you attack America, please, and we'll pay you lots of money if they try to fight us. So America's like, look, man, now we gotta go fight. All right, so number three is gonna be G. The US government abandoned its official policy of neutrality. Ba -ba -ba -da -da. All right. I like this question number four because I made it myself. The other ones we get from the state of Tennessee, they released them to us to practice with, but I made this one myself, and so I hopefully it's really easy. Number four, what was the effect of the event described in the newspaper headline to the left? So we take a look at the newspaper headline. Heir to Austria's throne is slain, that means killed, with his wife by a Bosnian youth to avenge seizure of his country. What this is talking about is the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. So what happens next? Well, Germany declares war on Serbia, Russia declares war on Germany, and all these sciences have to jump in and declare war on each other. So four is eight. Hopefully that one was easy enough. Alrighty. Here's a good one. I like the ones like this that you don't have to read as much. All right, so it says, based on your content knowledge, what does the illustration about imply about US foreign policy in 1914? So let's take a look. So the, the image isn't that clear, but here's what it's showing. In Europe, they're fighting, things are going crazy. And look, here's Uncle Sam, a gay USA. It says, don't worry, their fight need not disturb our business. And there is a hint here, a very big hint. If you look right here, he's sitting on a bag of money, okay? And remember, wars are very expensive. And the United States stayed neutral from 1914 to 1917. Stayed neutral, neutral, kind of. Um, so now, what is the point here? It says, what does the illustration imply about U.S. foreign policy? Um, well, the United States is wanting to stay out of the war, is wanting to stay neutral because wars are expensive, and we had lots of money and we wanted to protect it. So it's definitely going to be D. Five, economic consider considerations influence the United States Declaration of Neutrality. So there you go. Five is D. All right. Straight up good, simple question right here. Number six, how did the Zimmerman telegram influence US entry into World War I? Well, remember it was a letter from Germany to Mexico asking Mexico to join forces with Germany in the case the United States fought and uh, they wanted them to attack America. So it's gonna be this one, revealed or proposed military alliance between Mexico and Germany. So there you go, six is G. Six is G. All right, kind of a similar question. Why did the United States decide to enter World War I? Well, it's because Germany wanted to wanted Mexico to attack America, basically. Okay, and that is considered an act of aggression, trying to get another nation to attack another nation. Um, so it's gonna be G. A European nation had taken aggressive actions against the United States. And it's talking about Germany, and it's also mentioning their um, the submarine attacks, unrestricted submarine warfare. Okay? Cool. All right, here we go. Last one on this set. Here's Wilson. It says, Congress is called to convene April 2nd. It says, American ships sunk without warning, American lives lost. This cartoon depicts President Woodrow Wilson calling on Congress. So remember, uh, German submarine warfare pushed the United States to get in a war, a war against Germany. So number eight is B. So there you go. Sweet. All right, we're done with that page. Now it's gonna get even easier because we finally get to World War I. Oh look, a tank. It says, number one, how did the military innovation shown in this photograph affect the course of World War I? Now the tanks allowed the men to get out of the trenches. Remember the trenches, they had kind of gotten stuck in a stalemate and I kind of just gave you the answer. So the trenches, they couldn't come out of the trenches and they were kind of just stuck and the fighting would go back and forth but they'd only get like 100 yards and then they'd get pushed back and it's terrible. 
But when they get in tanks, all of a sudden, they're riding around in this big bulletproof metal box and they can shoot at each other. And so this is gonna change the game. And England has them first, all right? England and America. So this is gonna change the game in favor of us and it helps break the stalemate of trench warfare. So number one is B. Tanks were a game changer. Even though they were really crappy at first. England made like 25 tanks and it cost so much money, like millions and millions of dollars. And they got them out on the battlefield, I believe it was 25, and 19 of them broke down immediately. <laughs> All right. Number two, ignore the picture, it goes with number three. In what way was Alan C. York influential in World War I? Remember, he's a war hero. He captured 132 Germans and killed like 20 on his own. He got a Medal of Honor because he was a hero because of this, okay? So, um... The best answer is going to be C. He motivated others with his example of heroism. So two is C. Okay. U.S. soldiers during World War One. That's this goes with this. This photograph shows a military tactic that. Um, so uh, the trenches. You can't go out of the trench because you're going to get shot. Okay. And it's very hard to attack another trench because they have protection and they can just lean up and shoot at you and you're exposed. So there's going to be long times when nothing happens, where no side is gaining an advantage, and we call that a stalemate. So three is going to be C. It says made frontal assaults difficult, resulting in long periods of stalemate. Stalemate means one side, nobody's really winning, it's just kind of a tie. A bad tie. All right, keep rocking and rolling. All right. Number four, what caused the scene described in this excerpt? It says it was at first impossible for anyone to realize what had actually happened. The smoke and fumes hit everything from sight, and hundreds of men were thrown into a comatose or dying condition. And within an hour, the whole position had to be abandoned, together with about 50 guns. So um, if you're talking about smoke and fumes hiding everything from sight, it sounds like a gas attack. And it says they were thrown into a comatose or dying condition. So. What has happened in this scene? It's a poison gas attack. So number four is C, a poison gas attack. Cool, cool. Number five, how did trench warfare contribute to large numbers of casualties during World War I? Okay, so um, it's very dirty in trenches. It's very uh, dangerous to live in a trench where it's wet all the time and you're constantly surrounded by people. And you don't have anywhere to go to the bathroom. So disease is gonna be a major killer during World War I, okay? Not just the good weapons that they had, all these brand new good weapons. Now it's disease that's gonna be a big problem, okay? So trenches spread disease, so B. Alrighty. So blank, soldiers to their trenches, a stalemate developed, okay? So which action completes this diagram? Well, why did they have to dig trenches? Uh, why can they, why can't they just get out and fight? Well, it's because they have way better weapons. And one of those really, really good weapons was machine guns. So six is C, okay. All right, got a new sheet here. Just 25, number one. Upon entering World War I, the United States enlarged its military by, well, we started the draft. And a fancy word for the draft is the Selective Service Act. So B, number one is B. Number two, General John J. Pershing, he was the leader of American Expeditionary Force, and what they were is basically the first modern army. So it says he made a major contribution to the Allied victory in World War I by A, transforming inexperienced troops into an effective fighting force, okay? So America's army at the time was really not that advanced, and this guy, John J. Pershing, he makes it way more advanced. He trained the American military, okay? Number three, during World War I, tanks were used on the Western Front primarily to, uh, so tanks are kind of like the armored car to help people get across. So well, the way they're gonna do it is they're gonna, uh, the men are gonna line up behind the tank and near the tank where they have cover, and then they can advance across no man's land and then they can get to the enemy and destroy them. All right, so three is F. Number four, what was one effect of the arrival of the American Expeditionary Forces, a.k.a. the Army in Europe during World War I? Well, the, uh, it gives all the allies, the England, France, Russia, it gives them all reinforcements. And because of these reinforcements, they're able to launch a significant counterattack and win the war. Good job, America. Yeah! 
Okay, moving right along. So Alvin York led seven men, World War I. He did all this guy, Vernon Baker. We didn't learn about any of these, but if you know about Alvin York, we did learn about him. Uh, which action did the federal government take to recognize these soldiers? Well, what did uh, Alvin York win because of his bravery? Well, he won the Medal of Honor. So five is G. He won the Medal of Honor for actions going above the call of duty. So there you have that. Look, United States soldiers leading a trench. Which statement best describes the impact of this type of warfare? Well, um, because of the trenches, there were stalemates, like we talked about just a few minutes ago. And um, so they got to come up with new ways to attack the enemy. And there's a couple ways they do that. First of all, they start using airplanes. And second of all, they start using tanks. And we call those new types of weapons. So six is C. Okay, we're moving right along. We're almost done. Uh, so now we're done with World War I and we're moving on to the 14 points, okay? So Wilson's plan for how to figure out the world after. And it says, which of the causes underlying World War I was this provision of the 14 points intended to prevent? Uh, well, we're not sure yet, so let's take a look. Absolute freedom of navigation upon the seas, alike in peace and in war. So that's mentioning the seas a lot. So it's gotta have, the answer's gonna have to have something to do with the seas. And what he's mentioning here, he's talking about when England blockaded Germany and then when Germany responded with unrestricted summary warfare. He's, Wilson is saying, let's not do that again. He's saying that was some nonsense. Let's try to avoid that, okay? So one is G on that one. Number two. The Allied and Associated Governments, uh, we need to read the question first. One reason this provision was included in the Treaty of Versailles, that's the end of the war, was to, so we don't know, require, the, and Germany undertakes that she will make compensation for all damage done to the civilian population of the Allied Associated Powers. So what this is saying, this is making Germany pay for the war. And this is really, really bad for Germany. This, does, this kills Germany, basically. And this is actually the reason why Hitler, Adolf Hitler got so mad and wrote that book called Mein Kampf, which is called Mein, Mein Suffering, um, and then he's going to go and rebuild Germany. But um, the Treaty of Versailles, this, it destroys Germany with this, because it says, Germany, we're blaming you for the war, and you're going to have to pay $55 million to all the other countries. And Germany's like, we just lost a war, how are we supposed to do that? So this really significantly weakens the power of Germany, okay? So that one is J, and I believe we're on our last page. Number three here. President Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson's 14 points supported Poland by calling for its... Well, one of the big things in the 14 points is that it gives independence back to a lot of these countries that were taken over. So three is H. All right. All right. Senator Henry Cabot Lodge. He has a saying here. Let's see what it says. Senator Lodge made this statement in opposition to, so think about the 14 points and what it had to do with, and we're referencing the League of Nations here. The United States is, world, is the world's best hope, but if you tangle her in the intrigues of Europe, you will destroy her power for good and endanger her very existence. So um, tangle is the key word there, entangling foreign alliances, if we go all the way back to George Washington. Uh, Lodge does not want the United States getting involved in the League of Nations. He's worried about entangling foreign alliances, okay? All right, two more. Ah. So, I'm just going to, um, we'll skip over this one. This one's about uh, Charles Schink. Remember Charles Schink, he wrote that thing that said um, he wanted people to resist the draft. And that has to do with First Amendment. So, um, it's going to be this one. C. It says the Supreme Court interpreted the provisions of the First Amendment based on contemporary circumstances. In other words, you don't always have your First Amendment freedom of speech rights. Uh, if the government sees you as a danger, then you, get, you can lose your rights. Okay? All right. Da, 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 da. So the picture, it says, my life belongs to Uncle Sam, but my heart belongs to you. And it says, which statement analyzes the context of this song? Um, and it is inspired by events in Europe because he's a soldier um, and it's written, I believe in 1914. I think it's got a date on there. Yeah, 1914, soldier, my life belongs to Uncle Sam, USA, but my heart belongs to you. All right, last one. Woo! Which event has caused the United States government to restrict freedom of speech? 
Now, I told you, you have freedom of speech except in special circumstances. And if we looked at the Charles Schenck case, which happened during World War I, uh, you, during wartime, things are a little different. Things are considered a little more risky or dangerous in the United States, and you don't want to be divulging United States secrets. So during a war, you do not always have freedom of speech. So seven is going to be B, okay? Cool. And I think we got them all there. Perfect. All right, y'all, I know that was a lot, and I know this stuff is kind of boring. I do apologize for that, um, but hopefully it's some good practice, at least just in, as an exposure so you can kind of see. You've learned this stuff, but the state of Tennessee wants you to take it to that next level and apply this high-level vocabulary and stuff to that. Remember, so, yeah. Um, please email me if you have any questions about any of this. You can download these on my webpage, um, and that way you can go along with it as you watch. Uh, remember, this is just for kind of a practice thing, just so you can see these types of questions a lot before we get to the end of the year and before you get to our tests in this class, okay? Um, so guys, hope you enjoyed it. I hope you have a good day. Please email me if you need anything, and we'll see you later. Bye!